Well, um, I am Amadela Pineda, the new Teresa Lozano Long Institute of Latin American Studies Director, and I am very happy to introduce the UT Fulbright Chair in Brazilian Studies um, lecture, um, which is an initiative of uh, LILAS, Brazil Center, um, the Fulbright, and other universities. And the purpose is to bring together scholars who has who have advanced, um, interesting, and innovative views on all fields of Brazilian studies. And this year, our Fulbright professor um, is Teresa Marquez. And I want to introduce as well uh, Seth Garfield, who is the director of the Brazil Center. And Seth will take over and introduce Teresa and, um, and, and her lecture today. And um, unfortunately, I'm going to have to leave at 3.30 to attend another meeting, but I will be listening to the end of the talk. Uh, via Facebook and, and YouTube. Thank you, Teresa and Seth. Thank you, Adela. Thank you, Adela. It's my pleasure to introduce our uh, Fulbright Chair in Brazilian Studies, uh, Teresa Marquez. Uh, Teresa received her PhD in history in 2003 from the Universidade de Brasilia, and she's been a professor at that university since 2005. Teresa has published books and articles on a wide range of topics from business history to uh, cultural history to women's history. In 2014, she published A Cerveja e a Cidade do Rio de Janeiro, Uma História da Cervejaria Brahma, 1888-1934. It's an excellent book. Um, it's full of fascinating information about the history of consumerism, of, of food, in, and the development of the city in, in Rio de Janeiro. And that was an outgrowth of her dissertation. In 2018, she published O Voto Feminino no Brasil, and this year, an English language version of the book will be published by the Brazilian Congress, um, the publishing house of the Congress. As the Fulbright Chair in Brazilian Studies at UT this semester, she is in residence in Austin and is teaching a graduate course in women's suffrage in the Americas. So I'm very pleased to welcome Professor Teresa Marquez today. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much, Sam. Uh, well, uh, Thank you so much. I'd like to thank the University of Texas for and the Fulbright Foundation for the opportunity to be here with you. It has been a great experience to exchange ideas with you, with professors, students, to have access to the rich collections you have in the UT. And above all, I deeply appreciate the warm and friendly reception you are, we are all given to me. Uh, well, let's see if I can uh, communicate myself with you in an acceptable English. Uh, the question that I present to you, do we still need a history of suffrage campaign? Aims of shaking out your personal assumptions for those who are uh, watching us and for those who will have the opportunity to watch this later on. Elections are now part of our adult life. We are supposed to choose to choose a candidate, get in line to cast a ballot in the box. That's all for most of us. It's naturalized in a way. We might think things have always been this way. They have not, and they are still not like that for many people. A fundamental question, who was eligible to vote, rumored around every representative system for 100 years, since elections became the most ordinary way to legitimize governments. Before that, there were elections for local public offices, but very few people took part of these events. Well, in these years, it has been almost 20 years since now, since I had my first contact with archival sources of the third generation of suffragist women in Brazil. In recent years, I have enlarged my research interest to other countries in Latin America to see if the political dynamics were similar across countries. And I have also developed uh, a new line of research about what happened after the vote. It's what I'm here at this moment. Important questions remain unanswered because we still have much research to do. 
do men as well as women drive, uh, did men and as well as women drive enfranchisement? Did they share the same motivating motivations? Which portion of society benefit from these movements? Besides constitutional devices, which norms also contribute to define the extension of political participation? I'm talking about uh, uh, voter ID laws, which are the subject we are, I'm going to discuss as well. In early 19th century, when the movement to set representative systems started, only proprietors were considered apt people to decide for the community. Together with economic qualifications, leaders mentioned moral arguments too. In Europe and in Latin America, Politicians often mention the capacity of having autonomy of decision as a requisite to vote. Women, the insane, domestic workers, minors were ruled out of the equation due to their lack of autonomy. That is why for a long time, elections were no place for women. Therefore, we need to investigate and teach this subject because generations of women activists all over the Americas devoted their time and energy to achieve the right to vote. Many of them did not leave to seize the victory. Moreover, uh, the full integration of women in politics remains a challenge of our times. Another reason to justify our interest on the subject is the fact that remarkable principles sustained the lecture system adopted in the Western nations. The basic assumption was that all the votes weighed the same, no matter how unequal voters might, may be in terms of economic means. However, we, we long know that political equality that bound us is not a state. For Tocqueville, Equality was a permanent movement. Everyone should give attention to it. Otherwise, the promise of political equality would be void. It's just a word. Such movement, I believe, still involves voting consciously, being attentive to politics, knowing the history of enfranchisement. You might get surprised to know that the very legitimacy of researching suffragists is frequently put in doubt. Sociologists, political scientists, and even historians believe that the extension of political rights to women was an evolutionary aspect of the representative system. They say it did not result from the efforts of activists. Well, there were in fact several reasons why men in power yielded to the pressure of the social movement and agreed to enfranchise women depending on the political calculus and the prospective benefits of that decision. But without movements to vocalize the claim for political rights, nothing would have changed. The representative system everywhere tends to avoid risks. After 100 years of recurrent elections, leaders knew how male, male voters behaved. Most importantly, they knew how to manage male voters. The results of the ballots were rather predictable. What would it come if women voted? Would they decide with fresh passion? Would they vote under the influence of their husbands or worse, of priests? This objection was raised everywhere in Latin America. This is a common commonality. Well, under the assumption that solely men made full use of rational faculties, they were considered eligible to vote. Yet elections everywhere in the 19th century from Europe to the Americas display the dominant male form of socialization of the time, a masculinity that involved heavy drinking. I doubt intoxicated male voters made conscious choices. Well, I would like to divide my talk today into sections. At first, I shall briefly revise some premises of the representative system with particularly, particular focus on the formation of Latin American political systems. Second, I would like to revise some trends in the recent historiography about suffragist movements in Latin America. 
First, let me clarify one thing. I assume that in America in the 19th century it was a francophone intellectual environment. The elite kept itself updated with French political debates through books, press, magazines, and probably misery. Uh, well, that being said, let's move on. A tenet in Jean-Jacques Rousseau's thought was the rejection of any form of privilege, something current in his days. He divided the total political equality between individuals as the remedy for the nasty consequences of privileges. Rousseau also conceived that the individual had the sovereignty to take part in decisions re regarding the government of his community. The sovereignty the king once had should be transferred to ordinary individuals, regardless lineage or any other similar criteria. In his thought, the capacity to act politically was a prerogative of male individuals who could not delegate to anyone. Rousseau's ideas were very influential among the revolutionaries that took the streets of Paris uh, from 1789 on. During the revolutionary process, moderate false voices attempted to adapt the principle of citizen sovereignty to a viable form of government. So individuals would choose men to represent their interests instead of participating in person, in person in every decision related to the community. Therefore, politicians defended that the political system should operate with clear definitions of authority and a separation of the political work. The idea of a representative political system based on recurrent elections crossed the Atlantic Oceans at the turn of the 19th century. Currently, former colonial dominions of Spanish and Portuguese Americas were emerging as independent countries. The long and turbulent process of emancipation coincided with the restoration of political order in France, the Thermidorian phase. In contrast to the French experience, new nations in Latin America set in no emotion a representative system without having experienced the more popular and radical agitation phase France experienced, experienced in previous decades. By 1810s, the political debate in France considered two devices to cool down the temperature of its political system constitutions and civil laws. The objective was to stop the revolution or the over-participation. Constitutions obviously were not a French invention. Constitutional experiments spread throughout Latin America where politicians have been reading and rereading charts every time a new momentary political mentality comes along. So far, France has had 14 constitutions in its history. Brazil has had seven. Mexico has had three. And the list goes on. Of course, this line of reasoning, it gets more complicated if we consider the form of the federalist form that multiply, multiply numbers of the constitutions and norms. But anyway, basically, uh, this is the line. Constitutions are supposed, were supposed to offer instruments to build, build a state and reduce the chances of disputes for power. The alternative was to a minimal set of institutions to subsidize the government was the pure rule of personal powers of which the region has a long memory. Think of caudillos, mandones, all this super personal power, man. In other words, we learned the hard way that constitutions may offer rules of engagement but are unable in themselves to suppress local potentates. For this to happen, other practices need to come into play. If France moved towards a state-centered political system, liberal leaders in new nations in Latin America aimed at the same movement as soon as they saw a possibility coming. For instance, in Argentina, 
Right after the Juan Manuel process, political dominion was over, leaders made it approve the 1853 constitution, which lasted with minor reforms into 1949. The 1804 Napoleon Civil Code was another symbol of institutional modernity that influenced the writing of codes in every country in the region. It was meant to regulate contracts, trade, labor, and family law as well. One by one, the new independent nations stabilized, as they stabilized, jurists rushed to write civil laws. French-inspired civil codes appeared in Peru in 1852, Chile 1855, Mexico 1870, Argentina 1869. In Brazil, it took more time to codify civil laws, but the 1850 Commercial Code inserted the vice submitting wives to husbands. Everywhere, married women were considered incapable. Civil laws limited married women in many ways, power over children, property, and profession. Marriage turned women individuals without autonomy, a requisite to enjoy political rights according to Rousseau, Immanuel Kant, Auguste Comte, and many other influential thinkers whose works were read in Latin America. Why Latin American elites felt the necessity to adopt the principles of the Napoleon Code regarding family law. If French jurists meant to bring women back to domesticity and restore husband's authority, something put in danger during the revolution, nothing compared, comparable existed in Latin America where the patriarchal family was still the norm and remained so for a long time. It seems that customs were no longer a reliable source of law. Things needed to be settled in positive reading laws. Therefore, a just juridical system to a legislative idea. Civil law scholars argue that the manic to codify that took over portions of European and Europe and the Americas in the 19th century was a reject reaction to the old regime plurality of jurisdictions. Well, 100 years after the addition of the code in 1904, feminists gathered in the streets of Paris to burn civil codes, a symbol of marital oppression. While groups of women made public demonstrations, politicians and jurists celebrated the centennial of one of the most successful French export items, civil laws, together with perfumes, dresses, and so on. By then, suffragists, suffragist groups started to raise their voices in Brazil, Argentina, Mexico, and so not everyone then self-defined as feminist. Well, they criticized the lack of political rights and the restrictions imposed by them, to them by civil laws. The goal of obtaining political rights was always accompanied by a desire to widen the political agenda, whatever it contended, and to promote reforms in the juridical condition of women. Uh, let's uh, face that middle-class women were the most affected uh, uh, portion of, of society by the civil laws. From individual initiatives, we observe the emergence of groups of women claiming for autonomy and professional opportunities. Frequently, teachers, writers, few lawyers, and even fewer doctors made part of these groups. As more middle-class women broke the barriers of poor education and reached the status of professionals, the lack of political rights denied them access to public jobs. They were not full citizens. Considered juridically incapable if they were married, stigmatized if they were spinsters, individuals without autonomy and rationality, Women were kept away from jobs in the state, a major political bargain chip in Latin America. 
Despite that, and maybe because of all that, women's groups adopted a variety of tactics, defended innovative policies, self-educated themselves in political affairs, and cultivated resilience. Some wanted the vote to continue the political visibility of their families. Others claim it for social justice. All this effort was never for the vote only. So groups prioritized the causes and chose allies according to them. When feminist groups started to gather by 1910s and 1920s, politicians in Latin America were no longer, no longer took French liberal political currents as, as the sole source of inspiration. Other schools of thought circulated already and nourished authoritarian concepts of the state and political participation. Herbert Spencer's works, combined with Gustave, Gustave Le Bon's elaboration on the psychology of the, of the crown, and later Carl Schmitt's discredit of parliamentary de democracy, were appropriated by regional conservative thinkers. Poorly or faithfully, it does not matter. This bundle of ideas provided intellectual basis to respond to the F effects of the 1929 world crisis. Feminist groups still lingered for a room in the representative system as sovereign individuals in a moment when countries in Europe and in the Americas were moving towards a cooperative form of political system. Abandoning the premises of individualistic liberalism. Yet, in many populous countries such as Mexico, Colombia, Argentina, women remain enfranchised, unfranchised. They would only be enfranchised after the Second World War under totally different political circumstances. So, these considerations bring me to revise some types of historical resources usually examined by historians. There are three sets of historical sources mostly in use. Feminist and feminine press, parliamentary debates, and private collections of papers and memoirs. Of these three sets, I will explore parliamentary debates and private collections of papers and memoirs. Well, let's see if I can share my right. Are we? Okay. Uh, Parliamentary debates held during constitutional assemblies or ordinary legislatures offer many possibilities to understand how far political actors would go to enlarge political participation. During the writing of constitutions, and there were many occasions like this, congressmen faced the challenge of defining the fundamentals of the state configuration, as well as the requisites for citizenship. Eligibility to vote ranging from age, sex, race, nationality, literacy, and eventually religion too. There, are, there have been uh, many historiographical exercises that explore constitutional assemblies in most countries under the lens of polit women's political rights. Other kinds of parliamentary sources are bills rep presented by congressional representatives sensitive to the social movement's claims. In most cases, these historiographical exercises list an inventory of the arguments presented by those who were in favor versus those who were against a proposal on screen. By this approach, we can examine the political atmosphere of the moment is the possibility. In examining constitutional and legal writing, a historian needs to pay special attention to word choices 
because nothing is accidental in, in such cases. As Spanish and Portuguese languages flex nouns according to gender, it's important to observe the writing of the bill. According to the diffused idea of good, good legal writing technique, male words like ciudadano, cidadão, imply it to refer to men and women as well. In practice, women tested this ambiguity many times, presenting themselves to enroll as voters and were turned down. In important cases, such as the 1917 Mexican constitutions, there were right articles referring to men only, and they became a major obstacle for the enfranchisement of Mexican women. Still concerning norms governing the representative system, we urgently need to consider the social effects of infraconstitutional norms. How did they impede voters to participate in elections? Political injustice caused by voters' ID laws have a long history that requires our attention. For instance, let's see this article, an important article. This uh, constitution lasted until 1940, 1934. Well, uh, the the writing of this article does not differ much from the writing technique adopted in most Latin American countries then. According to this uh, article number 70, voters needed to prove to be older than 21 years old, provided they re registered themselves under the form of the law. This is very, that sounds very trivial and technical. And yet, is, it is very political. Poor people seldom have birth certificates to prove age, and public services in this case were insufficient. However, uh, voting laws added more requirements, such as proof of employment. This demand outcasted those who could only find, find seasonal jobs. Voting laws frequently demanded proof of literacy in a time when the state did not provide universal education. And, and here we have some uh, statistics. It's a per percentage of men, women, according to self-declared race. In 1940 census, 50 and 80 right, in Brazil. Before, uh, that's minimal explanation, before 1940 census statistics of literacy are not perfect for perfectly comparable. That's why I'm, um, I'm choosing that. By this number, we can easily infer that uh, the reading and writing, reading and writing was a white male prerogative in 1940. The last category refers to biracial. This column here refers to uh, biracial individuals, which was a large group because it included indigenous individuals in an unknown proportion. I prefer to examine only the black people category, this over here. Clearly, Black, the black people category is one is the one that most progressive over these years. In 40 years, the proportion of literary black women aumented for about four times. And yet it took 40 years to do so. So these numbers may challenge the more triumphalistic suffragist historiography. Instead of celebrating the enfranchisement of women, we should respectfully refer to the enfranchisement of some women. Did similar situations happen in other parts of Latin America? Yes, there are several examples. Okay, right. The last type of historical source that I would like to consider are 
private, private papers. This category includes, includes private letters, both the ones sent and those received in paper and paper suffragist groups gathered over the years. In facing these materials, we should always ask ourselves why some documents were preserved and why some others are absent in the in the assembly. In, in the other, in, on the other hand, why certain subjects are absent from the collection, we should consider this sort of documents as selections. Therefore, we should interrogate the criteria of preserving and discharging papers. Whenever possible, we should always try to cross one set of documents with someone else's papers, especially if the two individuals were opponents. With appropriate cautions on the interpretation, private letters can be useful to clarify the specific moments and tensions between individuals. We know that interpreting letters requires deep understanding of the language in use uh, and the handwriting can, be, can pose difficulties. It is always advisable to put the contents of letters in political context. Otherwise, the frame-to-frame -frame impressions each observer offers do not contribute to clarify a certain situation. Analysis based mostly on the individual impressions. No matter how well informed these individuals might have, have been at a time, must consider that the political positions of such individuals were unstable. Therefore, it's always risky to take a statement read in a letter as the ultimate political position someone would take. One last consideration, gathering papers is the an exercise of memory. Experience shows that women activists who care to preserve papers also develop other exercises of memory, such as giving interviews or writing memoirs or autobiographies. Luckily, historians do not need to deal with such materials alone. In fact, the writing of autobiographies entices the interest of many disciplines, psychologists, literary scholars, philosophers, they all devote their academic energy to the subject. Yet, the major contribution historians can offer to the field is the careful re reconstruction of the historical context. It can prevent us from stepping into plantation traps set by self-representational narratives. As a last example, let us see the case of the Brazilian activist. In early 1970s, she was retired, she recorded her memories, memoirs. By listening to, to it, to the audio, we are inclined to conclude that Lutz only achieved victories out of her long political life. Pictures show a different narrative. Here's a picture of Lutz in DC in 1959. She's confident as usual and as expected. She was a very strong, opinionative woman. And here's a picture of Lutz few years before. Vargas, the president, president of Brazil, once again, decorates her, but she is clearly in emotional pain. In fact, private records, private letters she sent at this time to friends informed that she alternated moments of well-being with moments of depression. She does not mention this mood, mood swings in her recorded memoirs. Nevertheless, she expressed privately how disappointed she was of the outcome of many of the causes she had embraced over the years. So if the point is, if someone listens solely to the audio, uh, someone's given a wrong impression about, uh, about this activist, about Lutz. And that's my point today, uh, a long 
history of the making of representative system, how women struggle so much to be integrated into that, and yet uh, they remain underrepresented in all, most of the places, in most parts of uh, Latin America. That's what I have for you today. Thank you so much for listening. Oh, thank you, Teresa, for that interesting presentation. Let's open this up for uh, discussion, question and answer. That's Suzanne. Sorry, I was actually just applauding <laughs> with the applauding hands, but I think Pilar has a question. Pilar has her hand, yes. Hello. Thank you, Teresa, for such an interesting um, presentation. So uh, I'm glad that you mentioned the Berta Lutz. Uh, we've been reading in my class or discussing uh, Catherine Marino's uh, work. I don't know if you're familiar with it. So I wanted to ask you uh, in the Brazilian context, uh, for those who, uh, Catherine Marino wrote a book about Pan American feminism. So I would like to know a little bit more about what kind of discussions were going on uh, with respect uh, of how different feminists who were looking for uh, the vote position themselves politically. Uh, there, there, there was a, because I'm more familiar with the Mexican case and many of the activism came from uh, unions or the left and even even there were some sectors of the Christian Democratic Party but all of these um, feminist uh, activists inside of these different political uh, groups argued for the vote in different ways I don't know if, if in Brazil it was uh, the same because I've seen that you have written about Lourdes, but that she had a, a particular position, but I was wondering about others and her conversations with others about this. Oh, well, there are many things in your questions and I would uh, start answering. Uh, there were waves of enfranchisement. Brazil, Uruguay uh, were, simultaneous or close in, in terms of years in, in terms of enfranchisement of women. And uh, uh, Lutz was in the, at the vanguard, was a lobby and a precious group, but uh, she did not have the talent or desire to find a, a bridge with a working class women. And the left itself had severe doubts if, if the enfranchisement would be convenient for women at that moment. So Brazil was uh, Vargas as a magnificent uh, act of, uh, of generosity, he would say so, granted women the right to vote in 1932 uh, to have a good face internationally but in, in domestically, he also calculated that it would be good for him. Uh, women would be grateful for him. At the same time, he uh, enfranchised and he granted the vote back to church, the Catholic church. So uh, right away, the Catholic church took the flag from the movement uh, Bertolotz was leading to them and started saying that uh, they had negotiated with Vargas and they were the final owner of the women's vote. So that was one of the fears the left had that women would be uh, prone or would be uh, submitted to the influence of the priests of, of the church. And unhappily it did happen uh, and at that moment, uh, it was the first time uh, a, a congressman was elected, a priest, and he may remain being elected and re-elected until he, he died in early 1970s, a very conservative priest, right? Uh, well, 
in this so this is the first wave a brief window of opportunity for political participation that opened in 1932 and closed was shut down in 1937 and so uh, that is uh, Bertha Lutz, the moment that she achieved here, the peak of her political life, right? So in the 1950s, we have seen illustrations. She was seeing uh, many of the causes she had defended for so long being watered, twisted, diverted from original objects because women were underrepresented in Congress. And so, for instance, uh, I have uh, examined a long, long way of a bill about uh, uh, married women. It took 10 years. It started in 1952 and ended in 1962. And this bill resulted uh, in a disaster because it said at the very end that women, married women were perfectly capable of doing the same thing her husband would be, but husbands were still the chief of the household. And this man that I have just mentioned before, this priest that became a congressman, had been strong influence in the writing of this uh, so it's uh, I I'm not surprised that Lutz uh, alternated this this mood swings because she was seeing uh, the causes that she fought so valiantly for many years being uh, uh, distorted all the years, right? So Mexico would be a different situation in the after war. Colombia, Mexico, Guatemala, and many other countries that were still enfranchising women started to enfranchise. And that is a strict, I would say, uh, result of the Bogota Convention, 19, of the Bogota Conference of 1948. It's a totally different political atmosphere in Latin America. And I would say it's a response to the uh, perception of communist uh, menace in Latin America, right? So it urged uh, governments, states to uh, stabilize and define a minimal institutional uh, uh, line for all the countries, enfranchising women and giving uh, them minimal civil rights. It's a token for modernity, uh, it's civilization, and also a way to control the political participation of women. Instead of being over participating in unions or local communities, they should be regularly casting their ballots for the leaders. But it's a totally different thing. I don't it's totally different wave and movement. Um, that's it. We need to sh need to try to to to, to divide uh, the waves and the periodization in, in every uh, moment, right? I have I answered your questions, Pina? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if my microphone is working. Yeah, thank you. No problem. Um, there is, I had a question about, I don't know if it's a question, an observation, a comment. It's a perception that at least in the early wave of the suffrage movement, there was sort of tension between the emphasis on expanding the suffrage as instrumental or reflective of modernity of progress that that was an argument that was used to show, like uh, to shame, I guess, politicians who were against expanding the suffrage uh, to women to say that this was, you know, retrograde backward. Um, but at the same time, so at the same time you have this sort of democratizing 
um, discourse, it seems like a lot of the arguments that are actually made to give the franchise women reinforced maternalist traditional roles of like women sanitizing, moralizing politics because they're inherently more moral, whatever those tropes are. So I guess my question is, was it the same actors that were using those same two languages or they, these were different discourses that were circulating? And how do you work with that in your, in your research? Well, we, we can observe uh, tropes, as you said, the same, uh, it's a good concept. Uh, arguments that were circulating and sometimes the same uh, individual might come with a very maternalist uh, trope in, in defense. It all, in some cases, if we can assume it is very um, uh, strategic when uh, it's what is necessary to achieve attention of the your opponent. So what you're bringing, what 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 the the vote is matter for? It's matter because you you're bringing something good for the public sphere, you're bringing a uh, moral superiority, you're bringing, you, how can you uh, raise good citizens, male citizens, if you don't vote yourself? So this is also considered a modernity, modern and mo modernizing institutions, but it's also a very, uh, uh, the, the content of the debate, right? It, uh, it offers this possibility of uh, persuading your opponent uh, to the, the writers of what you're defending. So uh, if you put this movements in comparison, you see uh, many of these ideas uh, being repeated and being reassessed there and here and there. The, and the emphasis is defined by uh, the political circumstances. So it's hard to say that uh, the suffragist movement in Argentina was more maternalistic, or in Brazil was more maternalistic. Uh, Lutz herself, she never had children, she never got married. Most of these activists never got married. Few of them had families. But if necessary, they would come to public and defend the superiority of women because they were married, mothers. If necessary, if it was convenient, it was if they, they it was there. So uh, uh, we it, it's hard to define an inventory of arguments in favor or against suffrages and say this is typical of this movement of this country and this is typical of the other country because it all it's ideas that were floating and uh, under the circumstances they could be uh, assessed if they were meant to be necessary for that particular uh, dispute. Uh, if no one has another question, I'll ask a, a, a follow-up. I was intrigued when you talked about the personal collections that you looked at, but I wonder if you could talk a little bit about what are some of, uh, uh, elaborate on what are some of the traps that you find in those testimonies and those memoirs? Uh, for instance, personal letters. Um, uh, we don't say things right away. We, uh, the language that we use we can find subtle ways to say that we disagree with somebody or uh, a situation that you describe or you put your a statement that you define in this year, later on you abandon that position because it's no longer convenient. So uh, it's, it's always risky once to, to read letters in, in the literal form, take the face values of, of what's written, and also not to put things in context and to understand that political positions were very unstable. Uh, so uh, Lutz and, and many other activists, 
they uh, live at moments when they were no longer in the pro scene. They were no longer in, in on stage and they were obscure and trying to defend their positions without having power, no longer having power. Uh, so in, in this case, we need to see uh, if someone uh, claims so much to be something, to be to have a say about something, probably it's because she is weak in domestic politics. For instance, Lutz uh, wanted so badly to have a preeminent position in inter-American politics, but she never managed to do that. Uh, because it would help her, it would back her up in domestic politics where she was weak. She had lost ground for Catholic leaders, for instance. And so uh, you, you always need to take these perceptions with the extra care. Memoirs are exercises of self-representation, how you see yourself and how you project to the world what you want the world to see you as someone who is valiant, someone who is brave, someone who took only the good causes. And you, you will certainly uh, uh, silence about your mistakes, silence about uh, uh, bad positions, and silence perhaps about prejudices, like Lutz, that silence very much. So she she had to live it, and at, at, when she was very old, she had uh, she lived in a huge house, and the basement was full of papers, personal papers. She did not care to organize those things very much, but she, she tossed everything because she wanted the posterity, the future, to know what she had done. Right? Like her, many other uh, activists. Paulina Luiz in Uruguay, she gathered papers carefully and it's all there. Did she gather everything? I would say for, for Lutz that she definitely took off discharge of personal papers, something more, something related to her sexuality. It's a great silence in her personal papers. She gathered everything that was in favor of her position, but she took away everything that would perhaps jeopardize her self persona, how she perceived herself. So this exercise is of long, getting along with these figures, they somehow haunt us, <laughs> almost 20 years getting along with this figure. Uh, she's not my friend, but she haunts me. Uh, I kind of put myself in her shoes and try to understand her. I don't agree with her positions, but I can, in a way, understand her psychology. Uh, it requires a long investment. Is it worth? I don't know. <laughs> I'm still trying to figure out. It's trying to put her away in my life. <laughs> But she keeps coming, she keeps coming. <laughs> May I make a comment? Um, I thank you for your, your talk. And I and this is not a historical or historian's comment. Um, it's just a comment uh, noticing how in this day and age still um, women's voices and also the uh, women's will and also the will of traditionally marginalized um, groups are still underrepresented in voting all over the Americas and beyond. And it, it kind of, um, it, it's just striking that after all of the um, machinations and work that has gone into all of, all of what you talk about that really um, white men are still very, very much in charge of our, of, um, who votes, how we vote, uh, whether our will is realized or not. Um, there are courts. Uh, it's, um, it, it's pretty astounding. Um, so anyway, but I wanted to thank you. And it just, it's just given me a lot to think about as we, 
as we struggle to actually have a voice even, even now. Thank you. Uh, uh, may I comment on this? Do you have time? Sure. Yeah, the last comment. Sure. Go ahead. Uh, last comment. All right. So uh, if there is another commonality in every suffragist movement. They try to frame a women or women, singular or plural, as a political category. It, it was necessary to raise a voice, to vocalize a demand. But as the, the vote came, uh, people realized that women are not a political category. They don't vote unanimously. They don't vote don't vote the same way. They, it's hard to find a common, um, a common ground for demands after the vote. So uh, the shift between a politics for rights to a politics for citizenship was a hard turn for most of suffragist movements because these leaders, they were a custom of being the center of the attention and demanding votes for women as if they were speaking on behalf of all women. When they had to speak to the variety of interests that real ordinary women really have, they were, they had, they found a hard time finding uh, uh, common causes or something that would, uh, I mean, some of them, the juridical reform was necessary, but there were other things that involved other, uh, other causes like uh, cost of living. They did not have an answer for that alone, solely. So uh, they did not have an answer for jobs. They wanted to reform uh, the opportunity given to, opportunities given to women, but they they were underrepresented and they did not have the either the vocabulary or the political resources or even the imagination to do something in favor of all this variety of interests. So uh, these leaders, some of them became obsolete. Bertha certainly became obsolete. Paulina Luisi, for instance, in Uruguay, she lived long enough and off and she was more imaginative and she made new alliances. She reinvented herself uh, and she was more creative. But Bertha, for instance, she remained, uh, uh, I mean, a leader of an old feminism that no longer existed in the 1950s. She was a best, she was a memory. And that's maybe that's because that's the reason why she became so uh, depressive every now and then. She, she was a leader with no literacy. Well, I wanted to thank you, Teresa, for that excellent talk and Thank you. To tell you how grateful we are to have you here at UT this semester, and we hope you enjoy the rest of your stay. And I'll say ciao to everybody else, and have, <laughs> you have a good afternoon. Thank you. Good very afternoon. Much. Thank you so much. Thank you.